Hello everyone, my name is Andy Wilkley. I'm the Product Marketing Manager at Blackboard for Peer-to-Peer -peer Solutions. And I'm really happy today to be hosting this virtual conference. It's a peer-to-peer -peer world. We've had three awesome sessions already and I'm about to kick off our fourth. Uh, notice that uh, people are coming back probably from uh, lunch or other meetings uh, as we kind of span the lunch hour across the country. So we'll give people a minute or two to get the software, uh, the application loaded on their computers and logged in. And we'll be back in just a minute to kick things off. Well, we're going to color outside the lines. Thanks very much. Hello everybody, my name is Andy Welkley. I'm the Product Marketing Manager for Peer-to-Peer -peer Solutions at Blackboard and your host for today's virtual conference. It's a peer-to-peer -peer world. We've had three great sessions already today. Uh, one on the use of mobile uh, in your peer-to-peer -peer programs. Another about using communities to really drive and increase engagement among your supporters, volunteers, and staff members. And finally, we just had a great session on branding and how branding can really be used to leverage a lot of different aspects of your peer-to-peer -peer program, from the relationship with the national organization branding to your corporate partners, and really what your brand and your organization means to the people that interact with it on a regular basis. We're excited now to kick off a session on coloring outside the lines, creative approaches to peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, with Mark Becker, who's the founding partner at TechSexus Partners, and John Collins, who's the Senior Manager of Events and Partnerships at Parkinson's Canada. There's going to be a lot of great content, I'm sure, over the next um, session, and you can access it if you want to dive back in and rehash some of the things that we talk about uh, by engaging the recording that we'll send out to you of today's session. Feel free to kind of peruse through it at your own pace or share it with others in your uh, organization or peers that might find this content really relevant to the work that they're doing. We also want this to be as interactive session as possible. So I'll be moderating the question and answer box that you can see on your console. So send in questions or observations that Mark and John can address and we'll hold those questions until the end of their presentation um, and usually pose those in the last 10 or 15 minutes we have uh, before the session today ends. We'd also love for you to tweet out questions or observations and you can use the hashtag P2P world uh, where we've already had some good lively discussion on Twitter and we hope to keep that going uh, while Mark and John are talking about coloring outside the line. So Mark, uh, take it away. Great. Thanks a lot, Andy. And hello, everybody. I uh, just wanted to uh, take a moment to, to show the slide again. This is my creative little bit here. And I, I did add one last minute thing um, as a shout out to, to, to Prince. Um, there, a little purple rain for uh, coloring outside the lines. Uh, and a little shout out to, to the creative one. Um, I wanted to introduce myself first of all. I'm Mark Becker. I'm the founding partner of Cathexis Partners. We started the company about coming up on eight years ago now. Uh, if you've been to any conferences lately, I don't look anything like that. I look more like, like that um, and been trying to grow some hair, uh, facial hair and, and uh, uh, growing out my, my hair and it's just not going well. So that kind of summarizes what I actually look like. Uh, even though it's a virtual conference, I thought it should be you know, accurate. Um, I'm calling from uh, Celebration, Florida, uh, where it is a very nice, beautiful day here. And my co-presenter is John Collins, uh, and he's up in Toronto. And uh, John, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? 
Sure thing. So uh, I am John Collins, and I think my photo looks uh, pretty true to form, so no creative approach from me there, Mark. A little less grainy, maybe. Um, I work with Parkinson <laughs> Canada on really our peer-to-peer -peer profile. So we have some standard or, or typical, I guess, events that we run, and uh, Mark, I know you're going to introduce that topic just at a high level when we start, and then we've colored outside the lines a little bit with Capex's support, so look forward to talking about that. So our agenda for this, this call is basically uh, a little bit of an overview and then get into some examples of some different techniques and, and different types of campaigns that organizations are using. Obviously, we only have an hour total, want to leave time for questions at the end, and want to make sure we de definitely give uh, John plenty of time to, to go into more detail about what they're doing with the lifeless challenge for Parkinson's uh, there at Parkinson's Canada. So, you know, not going to show you a broad overview. Obviously, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to type those into the, the box along the way or ask those at the end. Um, but we're looking forward to, to covering a, a lot in, in a very short amount of time. So first of all, I want to cover kind of the historic approach of kind of run, walk, rides. You, you host a 5K, you get folks to register, and then ask them to fundraise, right? Kind of one, two, three, A, B, C. Uh, you know what? That model works. And to prove it, we have the peer-to-peer -peer forum and their, their peer-to-peer -peer fundraising 30 that they come out with every year. Um, and you can see from this, this result, these results, this is from um, last year's results of the, the uh, different fundraising campaigns and this lists out the top 30 that they were tracking to and you'll see from this list the vast majority are indeed kind of your your standard runs walks or rides uh, so by no means am I saying don't do these it's a horrible idea I'm saying if you want to do something unique or different or in addition to other kind of standard campaigns. Here are some things that have been uh, tried and, and are working for other organizations. Um, again, while the top 30 is made up primarily of uh, those standard kind of campaigns, you will see a couple in here, uh, like for example, last year's number 16, St. Baldrick's uh, head shaving events. They've been doing that since 2005, raised nearly 37 million last year. Um, another uh, great example is Movember that's been around since 2003 and raised over 20 million. Uh, so definitely some unique uh, uh, organizations doing some unique campaigns um, kind of outside that standard. So by no means am I saying don't do standard events. But of course there are some positives to doing unique campaigns. More than likely, you won't have to put out or deal with porta potties, right? If you're doing a unique campaign, that's definitely a positive, um, and a good chance that you're going to be able to do it for a lot less cost. Cost savings can come in a lot of forms. Um, one that I I often think of, and probably not the main reason why you should do a, a unique or different campaign, but something to consider is if you're if you're using a, a fundraising tool, quite often you're paying for that as an annual subscription, regardless of how many campaigns you're doing. Uh, so why not put out additional types of fundraising campaigns other than your standard run walk ride, and, and um, uh, allow people to kind of fundraise in unique ways. Either do do it yourself, DIY type of fundraising, or a lot of other um, types of campaigns. Um, here's an example: uh, the Water Aid Canada uh, used to be Water Can. Um, uh, they rebranded to Water Aid Canada a, a couple of years ago. Now uh, this will be their tenth year uh, of the Aveda walk. Um, uh, you know, and they're using uh, the campaign. In fact, they're using uh, Team Razor for their their fundraising, and it's a standard walk, and they they've been very successful with it year over year. We actually worked with them uh, a few years back to create their uh, Donate Your Special Day campaign. Again, they already had the platform, they already had the tools, so why not come up with a, uh, a another way to use this this investment that they already had? Uh, and they had great branding. Um, their their creative folks came up with the, the look and feel of the site. We implemented it and worked with them on on how to uh, make make it all um, very uh, easy to use and straightforward so folks can donate their birthday um, their their you know wedding uh, so instead of wedding gifts they have their 
their guests um, uh, donate on their behalf to, to raise money for, for water across the world, um, or maybe they're just doing a 5K of their own, and, and just really seeding this uh, uh, campaign homepage with different ideas uh, to, to allow people to get creative with how they raise money um, for a tool that the organization already had. And then they took it to a whole nother level in, in recent years uh, with doing the bucket list adventures. They, they do a different um, uh, campaign each year. Uh, this year is a, a trek to the Mount Everest base camp. Uh, you can see some of the upcoming future ones here. Um, there's a river adventure uh, in 2017, Kilimanjaro climb in 2018, and another cycling event. Um, they did a cycling event last year as well. So they have kind of a plan for the next uh, several years on, on these larger uh, commitment type uh, of campaigns where people can um, raise a minimum, in this case, of $5,000 and then go on this, this trek. Um, and just look at this itinerary. I mean, this is no joke. But when I looked at it closer, I'm like, wait, activity level six. What, what is, who's rating this thing? Looking at this, this itinerary, what, what, what's a 10? I have no idea, you know, what it takes to, to do this type of thing. You might not be climbing all the way to the top of Mount Everest, but it doesn't exactly look like a walk in the park. So I, I want to get to know these people and their activity levels because uh, that's kind of crazy. But with an initial investment to registration fee and then, and then a minimum fundraising of 5,000 Canadian, uh, go check it out. And, and uh, I think it's just a really unique way to, to allow people to, to fundraise to, to go on an interesting uh, trip. I also want to give them a huge shout out because when I went out to check on how this was going, I noticed that they had recently put the shadow box on their home page of their website that highlights the bucket list adventure. So I wanted to give them the gold star, if you will, um, for, and I, I had to take a screenshot of that and share that with folks uh, because when you first go to Water Aid Canada, if you go there now, you'll see that it has uh, that nice uh, shadow box on uh, the their home page that would take you right to this campaign to learn more about it and I think that's a, a great way to to get the message out and um, to, to learn more about it if you and actually just bring it to the forefront at all here's another example that uh, we've worked with the colon cancer challenge foundation several years another example of where an organization was already using uh, the tool set for and again in this case a uh, team raiser for the team uh, col uh, colon cancer challenges and and their 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 um, campaigns uh, then they decided to go ahead and build it out and do a DIY campaign as well as tribute and e-card campaigns for folks that have been affected um, directly uh, by colon cancer uh, so it's uh, multiple campaigns and different uh, basically a, a landing page with links or portals into these different campaigns, but then bringing in an overall progress meter for, the, for their overall goal. And I think it's just a really creative way to share different ways to, to raise funds for colon cancer awareness. Uh, and then different times of year, you'll come back to this page and they'll be highlighting uh, different campaigns depending on Father's Day, Mother's Day, um, around the holidays, that type of thing. And then, of course, during their regular race uh, uh, schedule as well. So really creative way to really maximize uh, the tool set and, and allow people to find their way and their connection to the cause to raise money. Here's another example, uh, completely unique uh, from what you've seen so far, where uh, Mustard Seed Communities uh, has mission trips um, and schedule these mission trips. You can go onto their website and look at upcoming trips, uh, uh, Montego Bay, um, Nicaragua, uh, Kingston, all these different locations, and you can reserve your trip and basically put down a deposit and then fundraise uh, for you and your group or your team, if you will, to um, be able to uh, sponsor or or pay for um, your trip, uh, your mission trip, and it, it allows all the tools are right there, makes it really straightforward for folks that 
may not otherwise be able to financially afford to, to do these mission trips to go out there and raise funds so that they can do and help out uh, in different communities. Really, really uh, puts the power in, in their hands and, and allows folks to, to, to raise money uh, to make this happen. And if you happen to be a part of this team and you, you just want to go ahead and pay, uh, obviously you can just make a self-donation and, and you're off and on your way. But it allows people uh, different ways to, to get to their goals. Uh, here's uh, if you've seen any of my presentations before, you you may have seen this one before. It's one of my one of my favorites. Um, it's a virtual food drive that the uh, Second Harvest Central Florida does. Um, I was uh, we started working with them actually, but even before I moved down to this area, I'm from Chicago originally. My wife and I moved down to Celebration Florida and uh, Central Florida area about six years ago now. Uh, I've been working with these folks before we moved down here, but um, they've been uh, we initially uh, designed and implemented their first virtual food drive, um, but they've taken it and and run with it since then and been doing an incredible job. Uh, one of the things that I, I really love about this is the fact that they have this virtual shopping cart that allows folks to visualize where the power of the money that is raised and and the, the purchasing power of the food bank itself. So um, not that you're actually purchasing these items, but it's a visualization, and that's that's a disclaimer in there of all of this is is this is just a visualization where the money goes, um, but it is a representation. Of, of their their buying uh, buying power and and how they can really do more with less. Um, kind of going in more detail, uh, I want to give these folks again a gold star on their multi-channel communications. Uh, Maria, uh, who's been over there for since I've started working with the organization, and her team are just do a, a bang up job with their communication strategy. Uh, everything from direct mail to let people know that they're they're um, starting up a virtual food drive, um, to email communications um, showing that they're they're doing this food drive. And I want to stop here a moment and point out again the the importance of having the right Right platforms and the right tools to to make this easier not only for your participants but for your staff to empower your participants to fundraise on your behalf right and what you're seeing here is on the left hand side is the screenshot of the actual email and on the right hand side the administrative side of building out this email and how powerful uh, tools like TeamRaiser and, and there are other other tools that, that also do this and if you're uh, working with a platform that doesn't allow you to, uh, to personalize or conditionalize content you should definitely uh, look at other alternatives if you're if you want to really maximize that um, because there is really a lot of power in being able to target your communications to your participants for example it goes beyond just saying dear first name that's that's great that you're personalizing in that way um, but also if they've happened to update their personal page, you can say one thing. If they have not updated their personal page, uh, you can tell them, you know, hey, please, you know, take this, click here to update your personal page and, and send a personal message. Um, and again, in peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, they, they more than likely will have a personal page so that they can share their their connection with the mission and, and put out a, 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 a heartfelt plea to, to raise funds. So you want people to be able to update that page with their specific information. Um, going even further, there's ability to put down uh, whether or not they're a team captain, uh, tell them to reach out to additional, expand their team, you know, or help your, help your team fundraise. And then this even goes further to say, okay, if you haven't raised any money, we, you know, we notice you already received donations. Uh, that's, uh, sorry, I take that back. That's dollars raised greater than zero, so they have raised money. In this case, we notice that you, you know, already received donations. Well done. Keep up the great work. Uh, and if, if they hadn't raised it, there's an if-then statement, so they could, you can click over there on the administrative side and say, you know, here's some tips or here's, here's a, a link to a PDF to help you, um, you know, ask friends. We know it's difficult sometimes to ask people for money, but here's some tips to make it easier. Um, and, and taking that level of customization into your, your email communications just makes it really that much simpler to, to allow your participants to succeed.
they also did an excellent job with their social media, um, with their you know kind of branding their Twitter for, as you can see over here, the Feed Hope Now virtual food drive with with the the kid on the uh, shopping cart. Um, in their blog, they had ads off to the side, um, and also on Facebook, they branded that with a, a header uh, for a banner image for their their um, uh, Hope for the Holidays when that time came around. So they really did a great job of leveraging direct mail email communications, social media, all of the above um, to, to really make it um, really communicated out and make it as simple as possible for people to fundraise and know, know what they're, they're fundraising for and know where their money is going to. And finally, last but not least, they also offered up a wide variety of tools for participants, everything from posters so that they can um, start their fo uh, food drives and advertise them um, in an old school way, um, virtual drive one sheets to help folks set up their pages and, and um, fundraise, and also a complete more in-depth manual that went into more detail about how to uh, raise money, how to ask people for money for those folks that, that wanted to go that extra mile or needed that extra assistance. Um, I think, they, again, the, the team there just does an amazing job of really making it as easy as possible to help spread the word and the need and uh, help people empower them to, to do the fundraising necessary. And again, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to, to type those in, and uh, we'll be taking those at the end. Changing directions. Now, here's a higher education example, which is just a, a, a silly, uh, awesome fit for peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, right? Right? You have uh, a college, you have um, uh, sports teams with that college, and you have individual uh, members of those sports teams. What a great fit for peer to fear fundraising, right? So they put a little challenge out between, uh, Lewis University did this, we worked with them on, on developing the campaign homepage and all the configuration of this, and they put out a little challenge between all of the, uh, the different um, teams um, at the university to do fundraising. And looking at this, if you were, in this case, Mike's parents, how do you not just beam with pride and share this with everybody you know and and uh, automatically just get donations flowing in uh, because you know on their on Mike's page it has his stats it has his highlights and then you have the the actual team page uh, also showing their stats and how they did um, and it, it's just it kind of communicates itself virally uh, very easily by by having this out there um, they did this is before these are screenshots from before it launched but they had a very uh, modest goals um, based on what they had done fundraising wise beforehand previously they had been doing fundraisers the old school way and the coaches were like oh this is so brutal we have to do this again you know but once they they sat down with with the team um, that worked with us on building this out, they realized that it, it kind of it took all the work side of it out of it and made it really simple. Uh, they did these little team meetings where they kind of showed them their pages and they kind of preceded and pre-built all these pages for, for the team members. And, and during these sessions, they were actually getting donations uh, as the sessions were going on because uh, their parents would get these links from their kids and they'd start sharing it and have, have these donations rolling in already. So another great example of how the tool kind of just fits the natural um, interest of, of folks to, to show pride. Completely unique use um, in a completely different direction is, is taking in peer-to-peer -peer, uh, fundraising model and moving it into um, a, a different goal. Uh, for Canadian Blood Services, their goal was to get more people to commit to giving blood because they simply you know, need more uh, folks to give blood. So they took the actual fundraising out of it because donating blood or, or donating money, I mean, you already have a, a conflict or can easily confuse those two terms. What's a donor? Well, you, we don't want you to donate money. We want you to donate blood. So what they did in this campaign, we worked with them on, on setting up the target of how many um, 
folks that uh, different teams would get to commit to donating blood. And as you can see in the upper right here, there's even a book now uh, link so that folks could schedule their actual uh, appointment to give blood. Um, and it really got a, you know another way of getting the message out there that uh, folks need to give blood and it's, it's very important and made it simple for folks to get involved and engaged without actually asking for money. I thought that was just a really creative use of, of their campaign. Uh, if you were on the session earlier today, um, going back to kind of uh, standard fundraising, but a unique use of it uh, is Alzheimer's Association's Longest Day. They mentioned it in the second session this morning. Uh, I think it's a really creative use of, of the summer solstice and, and using that longest day of the year to have people um, in whatever they, way they care to and whatever time they had and whatever their interest was spends that day focused or, or at least part of that day on something related to um, uh, Alzheimer's awareness. Uh, so they open up the campaign uh, well in advance. Uh, this is a recent screenshot showing how they're doing on fundraising uh, coming up for uh, the day in, uh, on Ju June 20th when, when all the hashtagging and, and all of that will happen in earnest um, on the actual day. And it also, I think it's really clever to have these specific time frame type of events, be it a day or a couple of weeks or um, a season, to allow people to focus on uh, the message. So instead of uh, saturating it throughout the year, really honing in on a day or a week or a month um, as appropriate and or a season and, and uh, getting people to spread the word during that time frame. All right. I'm going to change gears a little bit and have John speak to uh, Lifeless Challenge and uh, tell you a little bit more in detail about that campaign. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, certainly some interesting examples that we just saw, and I hope that, that folks on the call will find uh, find our concept interesting as well. Um, what I plan to do today is just to introduce that concept kind of at a high level, what we were trying to achieve, and also what we learned a bit along the way. Um, and then some barriers that that concept presented in terms of how we were going to roll them out online and then how we, with the support of Mark and his team at Cathexis, overcame those barriers and, and put a product that uh, we had once conceptualized online for our participants to engage with. And that product is called Lifeless Challenge. So, I mean, it really started from a, from a simple place. We were wanting to engage an audience that was younger than our current target audience and that was not necessarily cause connected. I mean, we have events that do well generally with uh, our cause connected folks. And of course, like many, we were trying to expand that audience. And specifically, we were targeting a, a millennial audience. And of course, you know, that's, that's the buzzword these days. Everybody wants them. So, so maybe no surprises there, but we thought we had a concept that would work. So again, like many of our current uh, big peer-to-peer -peer fundraising events, it's a standard walk and it does well with that network that we're really close to. But we were really seeking a way to expand our event-based fundraising reach and then just overall to kind of expand our donor profile and, and get new names into our, our donor acquisition pipeline for the rest of the organization. And we thought that this creative event was one way to do that. So. It started again kind of innocently. I formed a, what we called a fundraising advisory committee, people that were connected to our cause that, uh, that we knew were really engaged and had creative ideas and could help us think a little bit outside of our organizational box. So put that together. Um, essentially with that group, we formed the idea of providing a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. You know, we know that in the standard peer-to-peer -peer theory, the idea is that the cause is what's drawing people to participate. And really, we know it's a bit contrary to use the event to try to draw them. But in this case, because it was an audience that we weren't already touching, essentially that's what we did or what we tried to do. So we, we started with the thought that this was a bucket list event, a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, but we wanted to put a more uh, positive spin on that, and that became pretty clear in an acid test that we did with our, our target audience and also with some online focus groups that we conducted that 
you know, bucket lists and Parkinson's and finality was, was a bit of a challenge for some people to overcome. So we shifted the language on that, tried to make everything positive and, and again, make the whole experience positive, calling it lifeless challenge. Um, moreover, thinking about the audience, we know that it's a generation that insists on transparency and authenticity, and they expect a lot out of the charities that they support. And really specifically, when we first launched this, they struggled with the concept of asking for people to give to them to live an experience rather than to give directly to the cause. And so uh, what I'll show you is through our focus group support and, and some support of an agency we worked with, we tried to develop that concept to, to make that ask a little more organic and for the audience to make the link to the cause more clear. Mark, I'll let you jump me ahead here. So uh, the concept started with six events. Uh, you'll see them here, skydiving, bungee, uh, close track car racing, zip lining, air ballooning, and indoor skydiving. Again, kind of all what we thought were once in a lifetime opportunities that would draw people to our cause to fundraise their way into these experience. Um, but again, all of the research that we'd done in advance and all that we knew about the millennial audience was that transparency was going to be really important for them and so was demonstrated impact and authenticity. So the events are uh, enticing. If, if you're the type of person that craves adventure and wants to skydive, then you know, parking in Canada saying that you can have that opportunity is great and it's exciting, but they're a little bit hollow as well, we realized, and they're hard for donors to support specifically. So, you know, with the support of some bright minds in our focus group, we, we came up with the partner with Parkinson's concept. And that's on the next slide. The, the idea here is that, you know, I, John Collins, am, am not the voice of Parkinson's, and while Parkinson Canada is representing people living with Parkinson's across the country, you know, the real authentic voices are the people who have lived experience. Uh, you know, nothing is more authentic, nothing is more real than a thank you message from a real person, uh, admittedly they're automated, but a real person who we have helped and who can tell the story of our impact on their lives through a number of different ways. So we reached out to these eight gracious people who lent us their voice, lent us their story, and, and told a very true tale of the impact that Parkinson Canada has on had on their life. Of course, what it also allowed us to do was to introduce Parkinson's to this new audience. We had a group of people that we were trying to connect with who maybe had no connection with us before, or no knowledge of Parkinson's, and were drawn because they wanted to go bungee in Ottawa, let's say. Uh, this partner with Parkinson's allowed us to, to teach them a little bit about what life is like for that individual living with Parkinson's to hopefully build in some cause understanding and sympathy with them and then to build a lasting connection either through this event or otherwise. Um, the way it works with our partners is, and I'll show this throughout, you, you read your bio, their bio, pardon me, and you'll virtually meet that partner throughout the course of it, your experience. And again, we're hoping that you grow to understand Parkinson's, understand that it's a condition that has a broader impact. Uh, you know, just looking at some of the faces here, we've got a broad range of individuals, different life stages and different life experiences. And that was pretty important for us because it's it's a battle that we're we're fighting in that the perception is that uh, Parkinson's disease is an, a disease for, for older people or people who have lived through most of their life course. And certainly that's not the case. So we were able to engage some young onset people living with Parkinson's who could tell their story and who also would, we thought, resonate with our audience. So uh, not just fundraising, but trying to change the face a little bit of, of Parkinson's along the way. So in a nutshell, that's the concept. But you know, as it takes me 10 minutes here to explain it to you, I think we recognize that it's fairly complex and a little bit hard to digest and certainly hard to execute in a traditional peer-to-peer -peer environment. So we, uh, again, we did enlist the support of Cathexis on this and put our minds to as well how we would uh, how we would make it work. So the project specs, we had six different event choices depending on what it is that you're interested in. 
and each of those events actually had a different fundraising minimum attached to them. Uh, you also had the eight different partners to choose from. And again, what was really important to us was that the partner was going to have an opportunity to speak to uh, a participant who chose to partner with them. So, you know, coaching email content can work, generally speaking, but we wanted to make sure that our autoresponders were authentic and were representative of the, the choice that our participants made to, to pick a specific person to partner with. Uh, and then, of course, we'd have to cut out the messaging of others to do that. Um, another interesting piece was that we acknowledge that certain people will be motivated by different different means to participate. If you're arriving at the site because you're adventure oriented, well, the event side of things is probably going to be your first point of entry. But perhaps if you're a little more empathetic or you find a partner whose story was really strongly resonant with you, we recognize that you may want to choose your partner first and then pick the event that you associate with them. So we had those different points of entry, which again was a, a challenging um, barrier. Multiple events was easy enough. We just set up six different team raisers and linked them to a, a home page, a splash page. But the challenge then became how we were going to address these other barriers. And again, uh, I think we found some creative ways to do that. The first of those is in making your choice of partner. And what was really interesting here is that we didn't want people to pick a partner with Parkinson's because it was easy, that it was the first story that they came across, or it was the first picture that they saw on our web page. Um, you know, we didn't want it weighted that one partner with Parkinson's had 25 registrants and another had two. And we also wanted to make sure that our participants were thinking really consciously about which one of these individuals spoke to them in a meaningful way, because then throughout the course of the campaign, we're hoping that uh, that that connection becomes stronger and then they build a connection to the cause through that. So I just wanted to show you on this slide that this is a partner box, the top two boxes that sit on our landing page. And the content there is actually randomized so that each time you refresh the page, you get a new person uh, that shows up in the first image and, and so on. And we actually applied a similar piece of code to uh, to our partner's landing page so that, you know, if the first time you arrived on the page or if at my point of entry, Larry was the first person that I saw, you know, when someone else comes along and enters the page, they'll have an opportunity to meet Tammy as well. And again, it was just a way for us to make sure that people were really engaging with the content that we had out there. As to the specifics of choosing a partner, each person had a detailed bio and again, these are great stories. As a fundraiser, it was it's such a powerful tool to have somebody just tell you about their life and, and uh, be comfortable disclosing that story to everyone. We think that we really had eight powerful messages here. Um, but if you're the type of person that really is just coming into the event and you're excited to skydive and, and you're looking for just the, the cold notes, so to speak, well, we provided the, the short bio that you see on the left, left that introduces you to Jamie tells you a bit about his, his story and allows you to choose your event. Or we have his detailed bio that, again, you know, we really hope people are reading because we know uh, that they're compelling. Um, moving beyond that, after you've made your choice of partner, um, we wanted to make sure that, um, that we had the content displayed in the right way. And Mark, this is shown on the next slide. Mark's already spoken a little bit about some creative conditional content and of course in his presentation he was kind enough to show the what you see is what you get editor and I've thrown a big block of code at you here and I apologize for that but what we wanted to do is make sure that when these emails came out from the system they were relevant to the event that you've chosen so you see that on the left hand side just some very simple edits that we made uh, talking about the commitment to bungee jump, say, versus skydive, and some tweaks in the language there. And you also see that, that later in the paragraph, Jamie says that he uses his participation in soccer in Belleville to try and make a difference. And that's a very specific um, piece from Jamie. Um, again, all the letters are signed from your partner with Parkinson's versus from the organization, because we thought it was more 
uh, authentic, I guess, or more impact driven to, to let them speak for us. The way that we achieved that was actually by making each of our partners a participant type. Now we use Team Razor and probably there's different vernacular for everyone, but um, we set up Jamie as a participant type and that allowed us on the right hand side to develop a custom block of code that introduces his, uh, his bungee jump tied story. Up above it is our participant Larry Livesey and he's got a, a briefer block of text that, that talks from his specific, pardon me, perspective on this. There's subtle distinctions, truthfully, but it was important to us to have that voice carry through from seeing it on the bio to inserting it in the autoresponder and, and the various messages you get throughout, and then to ultimately meeting Jamie on event day. We wanted to make sure that, that our participants understood him and his journey with Parkinson's as opposed to the general. Uh, it's worth noting that because we went that route, um, you see that the autoresponder headers have all of our eight partners. We couldn't conditionalize those based on uh, based on their participant type, but we do have the opportunity to do that in our coaching content and in the emails that we sent out. I'm sorry, Mark, to send you back and forth. We're now ready for my friend Alejandro on the next page. And this is Alejandro. And He's registered to skydive, and his event actually takes place in two weeks. And you know he's, uh, you know, he's pretty fired up about it. Um, what we did here was a few creative things on the page. Very simply, at the bottom, it's, it's default personal page text, but we wanted again uh, Alejandro's supporters to know that he was partnered with a specific individual with Parkinson's. So we were able to use a system S tag to pull in that Alejandro's partner is Jamie Faubert. And on my page, you would see something distinct so that people knew that, uh, that these participants had made a specific choice. Uh, and because it's conditional like that, or an S tag story, we can reference that in other areas of the site as well. Um, this is our default personal page. You'll also see a custom thermometer here that we built just to, to fit the brand. And you'll see the scrolling badge section um, our, our badges, if I'm being honest, could have been more visually appropriate to the campaign, I think, but what they do is acknowledge participant steps throughout their journey. So uh, the first one is a fist bump, and he's gotten that for choosing a partner. Uh, we've also got one that comes in when someone um, updates their personal page. We call it a storyteller, and they've, they've included that Then when they've qualified for the event. so. We're just using badging to reinforce, A, their fundraising success, and B, um, the activities that we want them to take anyway. We want them to personalize their page. So you know, very simply, let's reward them with a badge for doing that. Um, what's interesting here is that this is our first run through the campaign, and it continues to evolve based on feedback that we're getting from people. So one thing that we recognize is it was great that we were um, approaching an external audience with this event and that remains its, its chief intent but of course people who are connected with Parkinson's are finding the idea interesting as well and we know that they want to engage as well and we realize that it might be a bit inorganic to take a participant whose father's living with Parkinson's and maybe they would even want to do the car lapping together uh, but then to force them into a partnership with someone that they don't know so we built in a piece for our cause-connected folks here to name their own partner. Um, again, it's not quite as um, creative, I guess, as, as the fact that Jamie will be sending you your messages because I don't know who your chosen partner is, but we do have custom content for these participants as well that it's a little more personal and a little speaks a little more to the impact that they're having on an individual that they're connected to and that makes a difference to them. And of course, we're learning more about that partnership through the registration process and also through individual participant stewardship. Uh, we also noted the barrier of multiple points of entry. Um, again, if you are excited about picking Bruce as a partner, it might be enough just to see his name, his brief bio, etc., and you can choose to participate in the skydive event by clicking the icon under his name there. Um, what you see is the registration landing page on his right, on the right, sorry, and Bruce is the only partner that you see. Uh, we accomplished this by actually putting a promotion code 
embedded in each of those links, and it's worked out really well for us. On the next slide, you'll see a different range of options. So if I chose skydiving as my event choice and tried to register through the event side, well, I haven't picked my partner yet, so again, we wanted to make sure that all of the partners were introduced to all of our participants. So on this screen, uh, through this point of entry, you're seeing all eight partners. You've got their brief bio with a link out to read more if you'd like. Um, and then you can choose Bruce at the bottom of the list versus having him pre-selected for you. Um, <laughs> I've got. I know my uh, my project manager on the project. Marcy's on the line, and she really encouraged me. This is exciting for her that the um, the banner images that we used on this page is like rarely used in terms of participant type because maybe it's not that exciting to show a runner or a walker for our traditional events. But in this case, because of the creative way we were using uh, our participant types to to introduce our partners, we could use the banner image to then introduce their image and introduce their bio to, um, to our participants. Um, again, I've already mentioned the use of the promotion codes here, but just showing that what that meant for us is that it actually, we had to create two participant types for each of our partners, um, one that is tied to the event that has no promo code, and then this longer named one that contains the promotion code Jamie, so that if I click through from Jamie, I'm only shown his uh, his bio on the next page. Um, in truth, this has been a bit more arduous to manage because we now have 16 participant types within uh, each of our six team raisers, but it was an essential piece and it's, it's what allowed us to accomplish um, what we wanted to do. And finally, I just wanted to look quickly at our registration process. Um, we've done some kind of creative things here and wanted to show you them. In, in blue, this is simple, just collection of data, really. Obviously, what we're hoping with this campaign is as it grows, we're able to prove that we've reached an audience of people who may not understand Parkinson particularly well, and even maybe that we've shown an incremental shift in Canada in their understanding of Parkinson's disease. So we're collecting measures from our participants, and we're actually collecting similar measures from a cross-Canadian cohort to see how those numbers look during the campaign and, and afterwards. Um, in pink, it's a simple engagement tactic. It's, it's a blank field that people can fill in, but if they tell us what's on their life list, we'll send them a personalized poster that they can kind of track their accomplishments on. Hopefully that ties them back to the event for subsequent iterations, and also hopefully it gives us some good ideas for the next time we launch this. If we see that 80% of our participants have scuba diving on their list, well, maybe we'll find a way to incorporate that and to re-engage them. Um, in yellow, we recognize that our participants were going to be new to uh, fundraising in a lot of instances, A, because they're a younger audience, B, because we're we're dangling the event carrots and not the cause carrots. So uh, we're asking them kind of have they participated before and what their method of fundraising to reach their goal is, hosting events, asking for pledges, et cetera. And we've created some created, uh, some conditional content, sorry, that we push out to the participants that coaches them in that. If I selected events, then I'll get our email that has uh, events-based fundraising tips and tricks and how to host a successful one. Um, in green, of course, we're collecting information on their social handles and we're trying to uh, engage with everybody one-on-one -on, -one on those properties. And, and then just in orange at the bottom, what was interesting about this event is we're, we're kind of pushing the envelope of comfort with our, our organization and our insurance agencies. So we, we have two waivers, one on the next page that's very thorough, and then we wanted to address a few things about Canada Revenue Agency regulations here and the minimum fundraising requirements. So we bumped the waiver to the first page. We actually like doing that so much that in our, our next launch of our, our standard peer-to-peer -peer event, we use the waiver on the front page to just condense our, our registration flow. Um, and I guess it's kind of an odd point to end on at, at registration, but uh, that's where our participant journey begins, and uh, it's where my conversation ends today. I like it. Good stuff. Thanks, John. 
All right. Um, just one more thought before we kind of wrap up and, and get to the questions. I want to make sure we leave some time for that. Um, just kind of full circle here. Even if you're doing uh, your standard 5K, those aren't simple, right? They're not just a, a walk in the park. Um, oh, that's a horrible uh, analogy. Um, <laughs> but uh, they're, they're uh, th thank God, at least you're not on mute, so I can pretend like there's a lot of other people laughing as well. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot of work that goes into those, those right? Um, and you, know, you get very involved um, as an event manager or whatever your role is around uh, that type of thing that I always like to kind of put a, a little teaser or a little reminder in there to remember to always, you know, in new, new ways, uh, find uh, to improve and, and go the next mile. And, and, and ABTAs, American Brain Tumors Association's um, uh, case, uh, what they've been doing a lot of lately is uh, deep uh, an analytics uh, post-event. And the next session, actually, is going to, this is a good teaser for the next session because uh, Lynn's going to be talking uh, regarding uh, analytics um, and uh, hope you can make that session. But uh, we worked with uh, Lynn and her team and uh, ABTA uh, to analyze their event results for their 5K and um, just found a lot of uh, a wealth of information. You know, this is, this is the age of big data, right? So being able to pull that information out of whatever system you're using and be able to look at it for uh, marketing areas, if you're in a specific area of, of the country or the world um, or across the world, uh, where where the uh, majority of your participants or revenue is coming from. And if you are doing um, a specific marketing campaigns, making sure you're spending that money in the right areas, be it uh, working with running clubs or local advertising, uh, that type of thing. Um, and on the left-hand side there, kind of looking at uh, participants and what their history uh, with your organization and the event has been. You know, have they been participating year over year at the top of the pyramid? That's where you like to get people at. Um, uh, is it their second event? Um, have they done an event a while ago and they're being reactivated? Are they brand new to the campaign? Or have they they lapsed and it's been a very long time or extended lapse uh, that they haven't registered for at least the last two events. So there's a lot of information that you can glean from from the data uh, with your within your systems, uh, regardless of what you're using, hopefully. Uh, let us know if we can be of any assistance helping kind of looking at that and finding what you do then with this information to to call that information and, and really figure out how to best target and communicate to, to get people to register and to fundraise for your campaign. I think they did a great job with that. So uh, to wrap up, and you know, for resources, definitely um, David and the gang over at the Peer to Peer Forum have been integral in, in being a resource for peer to peer fundraising for years and years. Uh, Team Andy, who our MC for the day is, um, he's got a great blog. Check that out. Um, uh, peer to peer world. We're going to be posting all of these uh, these um, recordings for today's session. So if you weren't able to make one, or if you had to leave early, uh, or uh, you want to share it with a friend, uh, have them go to the site. And we we are hoping to do this again in the future, depending on how well received it is. We'll be sending out surveys after the fact. Check out our website, CathexisPartners.com. We do a lot with um, uh, organizations to help them fundraise and adv uh, advocacy support for online fundraising. Um, and we're, we're here to help. We've been doing this for quite a long time, and uh, uh, we'd love to, to talk with you and see how we might be able to help you with your peer-to-peer -peer, peer campaign or any fundraising. And um, check out our workbook. If you're brand new to peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, we put one together with ideal uh, idealist uh, um, on on how to come up with a peer-to-peer -to -peer, uh, campaign. And what you're seeing on the, the right-hand side is an infographic we made for that. And then, of course, feel free to reach out to John or myself via email um, if you have any follow-up questions that we can't cover today. Now, getting to that, any questions um, that uh, we can answer uh, as we wrap up here? Yeah, guys, we have some questions that have come in. And what I really want to point out, I think the questions will reflect this a little bit, too, is what you described was not creativity for the sake of being creative. There's really a thoughtful process that went into how to express your end objectives through the creative process. And I think um, that really says a lot to the planning and um, the insight that went into those campaigns. Um, the first one kind of speaks to that, and John, this is directed to you, um, kind of in the context of your partner program. Does it ever detract from participants 
that are fundraising for their own loved one, but their partner may be someone else. Um, I can see this working if you don't have a strong connection to Parkinson's already. If you ever find the participants close to the cause, they don't necessarily need a partner when they have their own inspiration. <laughs> it's it's a great question, and actually, so we're of course just brand new out the door, and in truth, we missed the um, the self motivated person when we we first put this concept together. And I mentioned in my presentation, we actually just added that mid campaign, and frankly, we we actually opened it up a week or two ago. Um, so, you know, I can't answer that question today, uh, but I think it's a really warranted point of analysis. Um, traditional peer-to-peer -peer theory would tell you that those who are cause-connected are going to be your most internally motivated, and people who are internally motivated are going to probably be your most driven and successful fundraisers. So, you know, we know that anyway, but then we've built the fundraising minimum in to try and obviously bring the others up to that level so that that they know what they're committing to in advance and they'll be motivated by the event. Um, I'd love to have that conversation, you know, after our next iteration when we have a full cycle of people registering with their uh, self-selected participants, um, but I, I can't answer the question specifically today. Great. I, I like that you're very open to learning along the way. And then, so the next question is kind of a two-parter that speaks to that. First, uh, how's the campaign going so far? And then what have you learned along the way that you've been able to adjust? Yeah, so, so that was certainly one thing that we learned along the way. Our, our first messaging out to our constituents was, hey, help us tell people about this event instead of, hey, you might like to participate as well. So we learned pretty quickly that our audience was, was one that wanted to be interested and invited to the event as well. Um, the short answer is, how's it going? Not as well as we'd like to. Uh, I think another learning for us is that while we put a lot of thought into the concept, and I'm proud of the online presence and the way the program functions, um, it, it, it is hard to be new, and it's hard to be new with a complex concept. So we've got our first run of events, again, May 7th and then 14th and 15th, and yeah. to be fully open, they're under-registered by, by far compared to my expectations, but what we know we're going to get out of those events are a number of people who are coming out that are going to have a great time, that are going to take photos of their experience in my branded gear, that are going to talk about the experience and share it with others. So I think what we learned really is that is that sometimes proof of concept helps a lot, and, and certainly we're hoping to find that, that once we have the story told through real participants along with real partners with Parkinson's, um, that, we'll, that we'll have something that makes a little more sense to people. Um, the other thing was, you know, we were early out with this, and again, we'd, we'd made a few mistakes with the site, and we've adjusted it along the way, just in terms of the way we presented some of the concepts. For example, I was targeting a general audience, not people connected to Parkinson's, but the second thing that you saw on my website under the exciting skydiver was uh, the partners with Parkinson's, and just their photos, no, no context or story. Well, now the second thing you see is the event that at least helps you explain what we're all about. And a 30-second explainer video that, um, that again, just talks about the concept and introduces it to people. We think that's a lot more effective and it's testing better with our audience. But the truth is we, we spent our marketing budget in the early part of the campaign. And we're directing people to a site that, that I don't think was clear to them. So, you know, the obvious learning there is... is as much pre-testing with your target audience as you can do to, to get it right before you're out the door. I think that's great context for the title of today's session. So when you do kind of step outside the line, outside of that very traditional, well-versed peer-to-peer experience, you have to be comfortable with failing a little bit along the way, learning from it, and improving. Kind of that fail fast concept and, and learn. But you don't learn without putting it out there for people. And it's great to hear uh, the, the feedback you're getting and the ways you're adjusting along the way. So um, thanks for that, Andrew. Be... And I, I don't mean to jump back in, but I think you've hit on a really important point. I mean, we we invested some time and some money in this project, and and our first iteration returns aren't as good as we'd like them to be. Um, but what I'm excited about is that organizationally we've taken the long-term view. So we are building already for our second wave of events, and we're going to try to launch that off the hype of the first one because you know, it, it takes time with something new, and, and I'm pleased that organizationally we've, we've grasped that, and 
excited for it to, to grow. Awesome. Um, Mark, this, this question is actually aimed toward you. Um, and for those of you that have been with us for the, the day so far, you've heard a couple of things referenced. But um, in addition to you know, small world labs and their communities, um, and raise more in their mobile application. But what are some of the tools that you recommended your practice for peer-to-peer -peer, um, fundraising? Sure, yeah, great question. Um, there's definitely a lot of tools out there. Um, and the answer is it depends uh, on a few different things. All the examples you saw in, in my slides today uh, were uh, using TeamRaiser, a BlackBot product. Um, there's there's plenty of other, and I consider that kind of the the the, the best in breed. Um, uh, there are a lot of other tools available. There are some lower cost tools. Um, there's some others that are specifically focused to um, uh, for specific type of campaigns that may be a better fit. Um, so we've worked with a lot of organizations helping them find the right tools or maximize uh, the tools they use. We're, we are at Cathexis Partners a, a BlackBot partner. We're also a Salesforce Foundation partner. And there's uh, a lot of organizations that are connecting different peer-to-peer -peer fundraising tools with their, their CRM, as they should. And if their constituent relationship management database is Salesforce, there's a, a few different options you have down there. Uh, Donor Drive is, is one, Kimbia, uh, Rallybound, Classy. There's definitely a lot of options out there. Um, and uh, would love to chat with people if they uh, are looking for a new tool or looking at uh, what might uh, be out there as far as grass being green or somewhere else. Yeah, great points. Uh, you know, it is a fast-growing and ever-changing area of our fundraising landscape. And to hear insight from folks like Mark and from John about the things they're doing and pushing the envelope uh, is a real bonus, I think, for all of us. And guys, I really appreciate your time, your experience, and your expertise today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for the call. Great. And for those of you on the phone, again, we really appreciate your time. You are now exclusive members of uh, a group of several hundred now that have heard uh, some of the latest and greatest information in peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. And we have one more session to go today. Uh, so tune back in if you can. Uh, if you're going to join our 3 o'clock Eastern Time session, you need to log out of this one uh, and log back into the link you got in registration. Um, and we've heard a lot about the creative process and your brand and different events. And interspersed with all those have been references to data and analytics. And we're going to wrap up today with um, a, a presentation that really dives a little bit deeper into that aspect of it, where we're going to turn your peer-to-peer -peer fundraising data into insight. Because really, if we think about it, data without action is really just trivia. So let's join Lynn Howes and Bill Jacobs at 3 o'clock uh, for a session on data. So thanks, everybody. And we look forward to speaking again in about 15 minutes. Thanks very Take much. Take care.